In this video, we're going to discuss partial molar Gibbs energy. Now, we've already discussed partial molar quantities in the previous video in the context of partial molar volume. And there it was pretty easy to visualize what partial molar quantities were. Here it's going to be a little bit more difficult to visualize, but hopefully introducing this concept to you with volume give you a little bit of an introduction into how it functions. Now, molar quantities have been very important to us uh, up until this point. We've defined the molar volume, which has been a base uh, intrinsic property for state functions up to this point. And we also defined something called the chemical potential, which you use the Greek letter mu to define. We define that as the molar Gibbs energy. Right, so we basically have a ratio between the Gibbs free energy and the number of moles, and we call that the chemical potential. Well, now this, if we're, if we're dealing with a system where the number of moles is changing, this definition isn't gonna be so good for us anymore. Um, now that the number of moles is changing, this definition of the chemical potential is also changing with it, right? So how do we define the chemical potential in the context of a system where the number of moles is changing, where maybe you're mixing some chemicals together, mixing a gas together, making a solution, having some gas escape, right? Any type of situation where you can imagine that, um, that the number of moles is changing, uh, this definition is gonna be no good. So what we do in those cases is define the chemical potential as a partial molar quantity with respect to the energy, right? So if we wanna define the chemical potential for some component I in a mixture, right? It's going to be defined as the partial molar Gibbs energy. So we'll have the partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to the number of moles of component I. And for this uh, case of the Gibbs free energy, its natural variables are going to be held constant. So temperature and pressure. So at constant temperature, constant pressure, and obviously the number of moles of every other component in prime is also going to be held constant, right? So this is the partial molar Gibbs energy. Partial molar Gibbs energy. Right, and this is how we're going to define the uh, chemical potential in more general terms. Now, similar to how we calculated the total volume in the previous video by just taking each of the components in our mixture, multiplying the number of moles by the, um, the molar volume, we're going to do the exact same thing here or an analogous thing um, to get the total Gibbs energy, right? So if we wanted to calculate the total Gibbs energy, that would just be the number of moles of component A times the chemical potential of component A plus number of moles of component B times the chemical potential of component B plus dot, 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 you know, however many components we have, right? We're just going to take a sum of the number of moles times the chemical potential of each component, right? To get the total Gibbs energy, just like we did for the total volume, uh, given the uh, partial molar volume in the previous example in the last video, right? So if we're looking at the differential, right? So this is for the total Gibbs energy. If we wanna look at an infinitesimal change in the Gibbs energy, right? So we know that the differential for the Gibbs energy is this VDP, minus SDT, right? That's for our standard Gibbs energy differential where we don't have any change in the number of moles of our components, right? If we do have changing, uh, if we do have a change in our number, the number of moles of our components, right? We're gonna have to add that in. So we'll have the chemical potential of component A times the changing number of moles of A plus the chemical potential of component B times the changing number of moles of B plus dot, 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 however many components we have, right? So now we've included this change in the number of moles in our definition of the infinitesimal change in the Gibbs energy. Now, if we hold the natural variables constant, right? So DG at constant temperature and pressure, right? What does that mean for us? Well, that means that this term goes away, constant pressure, this term goes away, constant T, right? So we're just left with mu A DNA plus mu B DNB plus 
dot, 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 right? However many components. So if you take a look at this differential, then this definition of the chemical potential should make a lot of sense, right? If we wanted to isolate, for example, in this, um, in this expression, if we wanted to isolate the chemical potential for A, what would we do? Well, we just hold all of the other um, number of moles constant, right? So if we wanted to get the chemical potential for A, you'd hold temperature, pressure, and the number of moles of all of your other components constant, right? So this gives us, this introduces the partial molar Gibbs energy, and it shows us that this correlates to the definition of the chemical potential. Now, it's not only the Gibbs energy that we can define a chemical potential for. We can actually do this for any of our thermodynamic potentials that we've defined at this point. Uh, we can define the chemical potential based on that energy property. And we're going to show this. Um, so let's show this with the internal energy first. And all we're gonna do is make use of this differential that we now have for DG in order to derive this for other cases. So let's do the internal energy first, right? So we know that the Gibbs energy is equal to U plus PV uh, minus TS. Right, we know that this is our general definition for the Gibbs energy, right? If we take the differential, right, we know we have DG is equal to du plus pdv plus vdp minus tds minus sdt right so we know we have this what we can do here is isolate du right just by doing a little algebra so du is going to be equal to dg minus pdv minus vdp plus tds plus SDT, right? So we have this differential now. We have this new definition of the Gibbs energy that takes into account the varying number of moles. So what we can do is take this guy and plug it into our new expression for the change in internal energy. If we do that, right, I'm gonna put this in parentheses so it's clear that I'm plugging in this expression for DG, right? So we'll have VDP minus SDT, plus mu A DNA plus mu B DNB plus dot dot dot, right? And then everything else that we have here in this expression. So we'll have uh, minus PDV minus VDP plus TDS plus SDT, right? So uh, what we get here is a little bit of cancellation going on, right? So SDT, gone, VDP, gone, right? So all that we're left with here, uh, when all these terms drop down, we're just left with, uh, what is this, TDS minus PDV plus mu A DNA plus mu B DNB. Uh, plus dot, 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 right? So basically what we have here now is we have an expression for our internal energy in terms of what that considers the changing number of moles. Now, keep in mind the natural variables, right? So in order to get this expression for DG, we held the natural variables constant. We can do the exact same thing here for the internal energy, right? Its natural variables are entropy and volume. Right, so we can hold the entropy and volume constant, and then we're just left with this same sum that only depends on the changing number of moles, right? And the chemical potential. UB, DNB, plus dot, dot, dot. Right, so now we're just left with this expression that only depends on the changing number of moles, right? So that means that we can still, in the same way that we could isolate any chemical potential using the Gibbs free energy, we can also isolate the same chemical potential using the internal energy as well, right? This would imply that the chemical potential for any component I can also be written as du dni at constant entropy, volume, 
and all other number of moles, right? So this is an equivalent expression of the chemical potential in terms of the internal energy, right? So we have these two different ways, right? That we can express the chemical potential depending on which free energy is easier to measure, easier to uh, determine, or is more readily available to us, um, we can express the chemical potential in either way, right? Um, you could do this with any thermodynamic state variable. So let's, let's do one more. Let's do the enthalpy, right? So we know that we can express the uh, Gibbs energy as H minus TS, Right. So this gives us ready access to the enthalpy as well. Right. So we have if we want to get a differential, we got DG is equal to DH minus TDS minus SDT. Right. Again, doing a little algebra. We can get DH isolated. Right. So we got DG plus TDS plus SDT. Right. And then same thing here. Right. So we're just going to substitute this expression for DG. Right. So we end up with VDP minus SDT plus mu A DNA plus mu B DMB dot dot dot. Right. Plus TDS plus SDT. Right, so here again, we get a little bit of cancellation going on here, right? So we got SDTs cancel out, right? That's all we get canceling out there. So then we can re-express our enthalpy change as VDP plus TDS plus mu A DNA plus mu B DNB plus dot, dot, dot. Right. So, again, what are our natural variables for the enthalpy? It's entropy and pressure. Right. So if we hold entropy and pressure constant, we get this exact same sum uh, of the chemical potentials for each of our components. So, again, this implies that we can write the chemical potential of any component as the change in enthalpy with respect to the changing number of moles of that component at constant entropy, pressure, and number of moles of all other components. Boom. So that gives us another expression for the chemical potential. So this can be done for all of your thermodynamic potentials. Um, I won't go through the Hemholtz, but you should be able to get an equivalent expression for the Hemholtz energy where if you vary the Hemholtz energy with respect to the number of moles, right, at constant temperature and volume, it's natural variables, right? You should be able to isolate uh, the chemical potential in a similar way. And I encourage you, since we've gone through these three, it's a very similar process. I encourage you to try to do this on your own um, to get this relationship for the Hemholtz energy. Okay, so let me go on a new slide. What does this mean? Um, let's kind of think about what this means graphically for us, right? So if we were to make a plot, if we were to make a plot of the free energy, right? Let's just say uh, we're looking at the Gibbs energy with respect to some component A in a system, right? If you were to do this, you would have an increasing uh, free energy Right. With respect to the increase in the number of moles. Right. So you would have some plot that looks like this. Let's just say that we have this relationship uh, for whatever we're adding to our mixture. Right. Then what does this mean for our general definition of the chemical potential? Right. The chemical potential then for A is just a slope. Right. It's just a slope of this line because we're looking at DG over DNA, right? That's going to be our chemical potential for A, right? So really all we're getting here is the slope at some point, right? So just the tangent line to the curve, right? At some point, right? This would be our chemical potential, 
right? So obviously it's going to be dependent on the composition of your mixture, right? So how much of your mixture is actually contains component A is going to depend, uh, is going to affect how the chemical potential changes, right? But that's how you can think about it graphically. This chemical potential, which we defined as the partial molar energy, is essentially the slope of what you would get for free energy uh, over uh, composition graph, right? So this is very important as a redefinition or more general definition of the chemical potential as a partial molar quantity.